I feel bad for Bengals fans. I really, really do. I really do. Because after the 90s and being the Bungles, you know, you got to a point where you bring in Marvin Lewis and some good things actually happen. I mean, it's easy to knock and ram on, bash on Marvin Lewis, but it's not like everything has been bad during his time there. He's been there a decade and a half. You've had some playoff trips. Seven of them, isn't it? Zero playoff victories, but hey, seven playoff trips, 15 seasons. Not terrible, not great, not the end game, not what you ultimately wanted, but after a basically entirely lost decade of the 90s, could be a lot worse. But you're going into 2017 and already ready for the Marvin Lewis experience to be over once and for all. And as the season goes along and it's yet another loss, Cincinnati Bengals season, you're hoping that maybe finally it's going to happen and that you're going to see the end of the Marvin Lewis experience and it's going to be a fresh start in a new day in Cincinnati. And Mike Brown said, sucks to your ass, Mar Piggy. Not only do I love Marvin Lewis, I'm going to keep him around. I don't know what it is if Marvin hits Mike's G spot from behind. I don't know what it is. It's almost like Mike Brown reminds me of a woman in the sense of everybody around you can see that this guy is no good for you. Everybody around you can tell you it's so obvious that he's not your end game. He's not going to be what you want to be about and you're not going to be with him long term. But not only does that woman not acknowledge it, not only does that woman not leave him, with the preponderance of overwhelming evidence supporting what everybody else around her is saying, she doubles down, digs in, and says, I want to have his baby. And then has his baby, and then six months later is stunned when he's nowhere to be found. That's what this kind of reminds me of. Somebody so stubbornly digging in their heels in the face of the preponderance of an overwhelming amount of evidence that indicates the time had come. And sure, you can talk about the Cincinnati Bengals playing spoilers with the Baltimore Ravens. It cost them a trip to the playoffs. Is that what you're celebrating now? And even when you talk about what you might allude to as kind of like the glory days of Marvin Lewis, that stretch between 2011 and 2015. Sure, they made the playoffs five straight years. It was the wild card round five straight years. And still, zero playoff victories to show for it. Even Jeff Fisher, for God's sakes, has won some playoff games. Marvin Lewis hasn't as a head coach. And after all this time, it's one thing to show loyalty. It's another thing when that loyalty becomes insanity, which is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting the results to be any different. Yet Mike Brown decides not only is he not done with Marvin Lewis, he wants to keep him around longer. What do he do? Give him a two-year extension? And then why? The locker room's a mess. The team is average to mediocre. Their window of opportunity was a few years back, and it's gone and probably not going to return. Why sit there and continue to hold on to the stubborn belief and ideal that you're going to be a whole lot better than what you actually are? Because even bringing in Marvin Lewis, and let's say Marvin Lewis finds a fountain of mediocrity this year. What's the absolute best you're going to get? Nine to ten wins, a wild card round trip, and a wild card exit. Is that the end game? Are things that bad for Mike Brown and the Cincinnati Bengals that they consider that a great successful season? To me, that's not the end game. And that shouldn't be what it's about. I just don't get it. But nonetheless, sorry Bengals fans. Marvin Lewis is back, at least for 2018. And it's so bad with Cincinnati that you got one of their websites touting that Cedric Obehi and Jake Fisher, while they've struggled at times, how many teams have a first and second round pick as backup offensive tackles? That's how bad the spin is getting for Cincinnati. Is you got to spin the fact that you missed wildly on Obehi and Fisher to the point where you're pumping up that former first and second round picks are now backup offensive tackles for you. Yikes. Whew. Now granted, bringing in a guy like Cordy Glenn, not a bad move, especially for where the Bengals were. They weren't going to draft a quarterback this year. They still have this stubborn belief that they're better than they are. Feel like maybe they could contend if they get a couple right breaks and a couple of things going well in the right places. 
So they bring in a guy to address their biggest position of need on the team, which is left tackle. Because Obehi sucks. Jake Fisher sucks. Cordy Glenn does not. If he's healthy, he's a pretty good left tackle in the league. So it was worth it for the Bengals to move down from 12 to 21 to be able to get a guy like that to solidify a major position of need. And then to turn around in the first round of the draft and take a guy like Billy Price out of Ohio State, who you assume is going to be a long-term answer inside at center, maybe guard, but probably center. Um, you know, the Bengals took a weakness, which was the offensive line, and improved it a little bit. I'll give them that. And when you look at this team, they've still got A.J. Green. And I feel so bad for A.J. Green because he's one of the best wide receivers in the National Football League. I consider him elite-like level, top five to eight guy for sure. And it's like we never talk about him. It reminds me quite a bit of Andre Johnson for all those years with the Houston Texans. Just goes out there and produces and really flies under the radar. But to me, A.J. Green flies under the radar even more than Andre Johnson did with the Texans. So at least I know one thing. When I watch the Cincinnati Bengals, I can watch A.J. Green, and he's special. Uh, but this is a team with a pretty good pass rush. Not elite level, but pretty good. They can get after the quarterback, and especially with a guy like Shaq, or excuse me, Shaq Lawson. Carl Lawson uh, had a pretty good rookie year, and you see the gunboats on him. You figure he's either A, uh, one piss test away from missing a few games, or B, he's a freaking incredible Hulk. It's crazy. This is a team that can get after the quarterback. I also like their secondary. Even though I was really stunned that they cut George Ioka, um, maybe they feel like Bates is going to play really well right away. I don't know. But Ioka is a starting quality safety in the league in the peak of his career, and they cut him. Weird to me, but not the player I would be cutting if I was a Bengals. And they got some guys they could cut. Um, but there's a lot of things that concern me about this team. Looking at their linebacking core, it feels like this has been an area of concern and issue for years, and it continues to be so. Their running game, you know, Joe Mixon had a so-so rookie year last year. How is he going to be as the true primary bell cow in year number two? And then their run defense, this is a team that struggled a lot last year to stop opposing teams on the ground. And I've talked about other teams, if you run the ball well and you can stop the other team's run, you have a chance. For the Bengals, they have to be able to run the ball better, and they have to be better against the run if they have any chance. Then I look at Andy Dalton. You know, Andy Dalton's the type of guy that you put him in a situation and you've got a good situation around him, you've got good talent around him, you can maybe do some decent things with him. But he's not really the type of guy that's going to elevate the play of a lot of others around him. He's kind of like an average middle-of-the-road NFL starting quarterback. And this team needs more than an average middle-of-the-road starting quarterback. So unless Andy Dalton's going to pull this MVP season out of his ass, deep, deep out of his ass, like past his prostate G-spot ass, you're going to get what you're going to get. And then you look at Marvin Lewis. He's been the guy in charge for a decade and a half. At some point in time, you have to wonder when the message no longer is sinking in and the message is no longer getting across. And I feel like we've gotten to that point. You keep doing things primarily the same way, and you're not really getting results for it. It's just that simple. So I look at the Bengals right now, and I'm sorry. I just don't see much reason for excitement. I just don't see much reason for anticipation. And I see a team that's going to finish like 6-10 and 10 and finish last. That's right, I said it, last in the AFC North. Sorry, it's just what I see.